Welcome back, everyone, to another edition of the Prove Me Wrong podcast. As always, I'm your host, Pete Lieb. I'm glad you're along with me for today. As you know by now, on the show, I like to provide airtime for all points of view. I really try not to wedge myself into any one ideological stance because I feel like once I do that, then I lose objectivity and the ability to see a bigger picture. Uh, Last week on the program, I talked to a conspiracy theory, quote unquote, with a self-proclaimed skeptic, but in reality, he served mostly to debunk what he considered conspiracy theories and really just kind of gave me the mainstream uh, view on most cases. Uh, So tonight, I'm back at it again, and I'm very pleased to take the other side of this discussion with my guest, author and researcher Donald Jeffries. Donald and I are going to talk about some of our hidden history, crimes, conspiracies, and cover-ups within American politics and maybe even society at large. What are those in power doing that keep us and keeping from us, and why? Donald is the author of several best-selling nonfiction books, including Hidden History, an Exposé of Modern Crimes, Conspiracies, and Cover-Ups in American Politics, Survival of the Richest, How the Corruption of the Marketplace and the Disparity of Wealth Created the Greatest Conspiracy of All, Crimes and Cover-Ups in American Politics, 1776, to 1963, and his newest book, Bullyocracy, How the Social Hierarchy Enables Bullies to Rule Schools, Workplaces, and Society at Large. I am pleased to have Jeffrey with me today. You can find him online on his blog, donaldjeffries.wordpress.com, and you can also find all of his books on amazon.com. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to welcome Don to the Prove Me Wrong podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. My uh, pleasure. So let me start then. I mean, you're the author of both fiction and nonfiction books. What got you involved in writing about the crimes and cover-ups within the American political process and society at large? Well, I started uh, down that uh, that road, perhaps an ill-begotten road. Uh, you know, yeah. Some people would think uh, as a teenager uh, when I started uh, looking into the JFK assassination, and uh, I, uh, there was a, a group called the Citizens, Citizens Committee of Inquiry, uh, which was nationwide. It was run by Mark Lane, the most famous critic of the Warren Report, who wrote Rush to Judgment. Still, I think, the, the, still the biggest selling book ever written uh, about the JFK assassination, criticizing it. Uh, he was my hero. And I was, you know, it was giddy. I headed a chapter in my area. I got to meet him. I a memorable day I write about in Hidden History. So, uh, you know, once you start, at least for some of us, once uh, you whet your appetite with a few of those books, and you know, I went through the 26 volumes, I actually went to my library and read the testimony and so forth. Wow. You become really uh, immersed in all the minutia, and you can get lost. But and I, as somebody who loved the Kennedys, uh, it was kind of a, a natural thing for me to do. And uh, from there, you know, I spent a long time doing that. But uh, eventually, I became disillusioned. With, uh, at that point, I was kind of a radical Democrat, and I, I started realizing that Democrats weren't the good guys, and there are no good guys, apparently. So uh, I became an independent, and I started looking at some right-wing conspiracies, the Council of Foreign Relations, and things like that. And uh, it opened my eyes to a broader perspective, and then I just started, uh, you know, when, when anything would come up, really from the 90s on especially, I would just kind of roll my eyes. And uh, I never really intended to write nonfiction. First of all, I didn't think I could get this stuff published, to be honest with you. Right. (laughs) You know, because it's very controversial. But fortunately, my my main publisher, Skyhorse, which is a division of Simon & Schuster, really does. I mean, they publish me. So they they publish, uh, uh, you know, a lot of controversial works. Trine Day, they publish Bullyocracy, my newest book, they do as well. So at least there's a couple publishers out there that are uh, fearless and Mm -hmm. are willing to take on these kind of forbidden so- topics or forbidden points of view. In my, I'm writing at these from a perspective that is frowned upon in society because I'm, I'm basically, as people say, you think everything's a conspiracy. Well, I think we're being run by people who can be defined as conspirators. I think this is standard right. operating procedure for them. I don't think they know any other way to act. I think this is just you know, a way of doing business for them. So they conspire as, as normally as you and I breathe. This is what they do. And uh, so uh, if they didn't conspire, that would be unusual. I think what's hard is finding these things that aren't a conspiracy. So let me go back just a moment. So did you just tell me, and I, maybe I misheard it, that you went and read all 26 volumes 
Is this the Warren Warren report? Warren well, I did, yes, the, the Warren Commission's hearings and exhibits. Now, I didn't go through. <laughs> uh, I, re I read all the testimony. Okay. Uh, because because half I don't think it's quite half, but almost half of them are exhibits, and most of the exhibits are meaningless. So yeah. no, I didn't wade through them. I was aware of what was in them. I, I checked them a couple times to verify that what was there. You know, yes, there are pictures of Oswald's pubic hairs. Really oh my goodness! In the record. And uh, there are uh, there are pictures of uh, uh, Jack Ruby's dental charts. And as Mark Lane pointed out early on, you know that wouldn't have been relevant if he had bit Oswald to death. You know, it made no right. sense. So uh, there, those a lot of mean the obvious padding of the record. But you had to go. I did wade through the testimony. And uh, just to find things maybe the original critics missed, I found a few things, but also to verify that they were accurate in the way they presented the testimony. And it really is – it's as bad as they say when you see uh, Kevin Costner as, uh, as uh, Jim Garrison in, in Oliver Stone's wonderful movie JFK, which I caught, taught a course on uh, to, through my uh, – unbelievably enough, my county let me teach a course on Oliver Stone's JFK for years mm -hmm. uh, through my adult education program over here. So I, I know the movie Inside Out, and when you hear that line where he's saying, ask the question, ask the question, where he's reading the testimony, those of us that have read that testimony have said the same thing because uh, they failed over and over again to ask the relevant questions, and I just don't think that was by accident. So when I hear somebody say it was a benign conspiracy, no, it wasn't benign at all. They knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, they, they rounded up a bunch of irrelevant witnesses, and they left out a lot of important ones, and the ones they did have, they failed to ask uh, pertinent questions too they padded the record you know asking you know where did you go to school about marriages and nonsense mm -hmm. that had nothing to do with it. but and you as you watch it, you can see the, the how they're padding the record so uh there was nothing you know benign about it it was a very purposeful cover-up and uh the people that did it uh were you know textbook conspirators in my view i don't know what else you would call them because they were they had to know what they were doing I mean, if, if I'm a young lawyer and, and I'm and like somebody like Arlen Specter, who later became a senator for a long time and that was uh, really gained, I guess, some renown during the, uh, uh, the Clarence Thomas series with Anita Hill. But uh, at the time, he was a young lawyer in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and he's the one who invented the single bullet theory. But he had to have known when they were calling witnesses like – I mean, they found uh, somebody – a woman who had uh, known someone who knew the – had never even met anyone in the Oswald family had known someone 27 years before that babysat for infant or something, and, and they called her as a witness. Wow. And yet they didn't call, uh, you know, people that, uh, people like um, uh, Admiral Berkeley, who was the president's uh, physician and who was at every hot spot that day, was a recipient of all the, the medical evidence, to which is so much questionable things about, as you know, they didn't call him. So I, I don't know how else you define something like that, but clearly that was planned. That was an accidental oversight. Do you feel that all of the true evidence was really displayed or did they really hold things back? I mean, are there still things that we haven't seen or don't know? Or did they just, did they provide it all but craft it in a way that still fit their narrative? Well, you know, I I was one of the first ones to believe what, uh, and he's still alive, Vincent Solandria, Philadelphia. He never wrote a book for some reason on the assassination. So that's maybe why he's not as well known, but he right. did a lot of the early investigating. I think he's 90 some years old. I've tried to track him down to have him on my radio show, but he's hard to get a hold of. I'm sure he probably doesn't do Skype or anything. Yeah. But uh, he did some really great work, and he wrote something early on that I, I read, and I said, "Wow, that's my feelings exactly." And he talked about how the cover-up was designed to be the way it was. Uh, they purposely uh, left it so obvious. For instance, the, it took me forever to realize. You know, I do talk about the Magic Bullet CE399. Uh, it was almost in perfect condition. Yeah. Well, it took me a long time to be sophisticated enough to say, wait a minute, you know, if you're going to put these are these are obviously uh, really powerful conspirators. They're not just a, a bunch of uh, you know kids doing this. If you're going to plan a bullet, why wouldn't you make it look like it hit something? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, For sure. So it, I call those calling cards and we saw another big calling card at uh, on 9-11 when you had the magic passport that appeared on all the rubble. Everything else is blown to smithereens. But one of the magical passport of the alleged fact. So I call those things. Uh, I call them calling cards. I think they're left there, as Salandria talked about. They want the public to know because they know, no matter how obvious they make it, there are only a certain percentage of us that are going to see through it. They can make it as obvious as they want. We see this today, and and so many things that uh, you know that that are happening that people just don't question because they 
And I think, again, it's done that way because they could certainly have, have uh, constructed a much better cover-up if no, they'd wanted to. No doubt. And, and it's funny you should say the passport because I had, I had read that before. I had actually even mentioned it before. But with in this age of, of Photoshop and social media where things are, are attributed incorrectly all the time, I wasn't really positive that it actually was real, that it actually occurred. And so right. when somebody else is saying that, so that was a true thing. They did actually find one of the uh, the uh, hijackers' passports right. in the rubble, even after the plane had burst into an enormous fireball and the entire building right. had come down at that point, and they still find right. this passport. Well, again, this this is the claim. Yeah, that's so, strange. Again, and, and, and we don't, I mean, uh, because I don't believe that happened the way they said it did. Mm-hmm. No, I don't think they did actually find a passport, but I think this was the story put out there. Okay. And, and uh, for public consumption, because they, again, they want, they had another story like that about uh, one of the, uh, a wedding ring that was found, I believe. I don't want to, you know, just, just, and of course it was a heart tugging at the heartstring story, this right. couple. And, uh, but again, when you, when you've looked at enough of these cases, you see through that. But again, most Americans, unfortunately, when they hear these stories, they respond to the emotional talking points there. Oh, that's terrible! The wedding ring, you know, isn't that point? And they don't—they don't look at the logistics of. Wait a minute, how did that happen? What are the odds? Of, talk about a needle on a haystack. But uh, so these things are everywhere. When once you examine these cases and look at them, and you see the same common threads, and, and certainly my book's Hidden History and uh, Crimes and Cover-ups, uh, which is kind of a prequel to mm-hmm. Hidden History, you see the same kind of uh, uh, similar. Uh, attributes to all these incidents. You see the unnatural deaths, which I talk about quite a bit, uh, the destruction of evidence, the missing evidence, things like that, uh, accidental, uh, you, know, you know, getting rid of, uh, of you know, videotaping so- over something really important, things like that. We see it over and over again. Oh, man, it's just we made a mistake. Well, they seem to make these mistakes over and over again. And uh, you wonder how they can ever solve any crime. And certainly there's a so when you factor in something like JFK, you have the Dallas police force. And I think when you see, certainly our police now are under more scrutiny than ever with what's going on. But when you look at, uh, because police are under a policing for profit system and their primary purpose is to bring revenue into the state. And that's mainly through traffic tickets. They're not used to doing a whole lot of uh, investigating real crime. And so when they're especially thrust into something like that, the Dallas police in 1963, uh, they were in way over their heads. So I don't know how mm-hmm. much of a cover-up there had to be with the Dallas police. I think they were good old boys, and they were not used to investigating anything like this. And they probably made a lot of the same sloppy mistakes they normally would make, but they just weren't under that kind of scrutiny. And I think that was probably by design. They wanted that to happen. So in that case, I'm not sure how much of that it might have just been happenstance and just typical uh, sloppy uh, work. For instance, the chain of possession problems there, and I've talked about that many times. That if Lee Harvey Oswald had been brought to trial in an honest courtroom, which he probably wouldn't have been, right? Let's, let's face it. But if he had, uh, they wouldn't have had a case against him because the the, the alleged gun, the alleged bullets, uh, the ammunition, everything in the case, including the, uh, the 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 revolver with the shot supposedly shot to Officer Tippett, the Dallas police officer. All of it had severe chain of possession problems, to put it uh, kindly. And a real good offensive defense attorney would have uh, gotten all of that thrown out of court, so they would have had nothing to to prosecute Lee Harvey Oswald with because they had no, they wouldn't have had any weapon, they wouldn't have had any ammunition. But uh, fortunately, we never got to see if that would have happened because he was silenced. I think we could probably talk, and I think probably people have for you know decades regarding JFK mm-hmm. for sure. Right. Uh, but I, I think it does speak to you were you were talking about um, the public really just not asking that next question. And it, and it does kind of speak to the dumbing down of society in general, but American society, uh, society specifically as well, to the point where if we hear it on in, on the news, it's truth. Whatever we hear on the news is the truth. Uh, don't ask that that next question. Don't ever think critically about what are they telling you here regarding just to go to right where we are right now, uh, you know, the, the COVID pandemic that we are right now, I think I've read on your blog, you call it the plandemic. So I'm assuming yes. that, that you also think that that's some type of psyop from the, the U.S. government. But, but when they're actually physically telling you that I've heard it online, that the death rates include 
just deaths that happen to have COVID. Yes. So yes. heart attack, COVID death. A right. fatal fall, COVID death. Car crash, right. COVID death. So they are telling you point blank yeah. on video that we are counting every death where the person tested with antibodies or tested currently with COVID as a COVID death. But so now you need to really worry about the fact that you're going to die from COVID. Well, no, you're not. Not necessarily. Uh, out, of the, out of those 35,000 deaths we've had or whatever that number may be, you know, uh, in 35,000 in New York. How many yeah. of those were fatal falls, car crashes, heart attacks, uh, already people in hospice? Uh, you know, yeah. a lot of those were um, rest homes um, that are not, you know, yes. hospice or homes, uh, old, yes. old homes. Yes, homes. Sure, sure. They're already maybe already there and they happen to get COVID, COVID death. So right. what what is your current thought about where we're at with these? Because to me, again, it's either a significant conspiracy or it is just ridiculous gross negligence on the part of the government and the reporting agencies. I've also heard they're reporting, they're calling new cases as any time you get a positive result versus right. tying right. that back to me. If I have a positive case, I have to get tested three more times. Instead of calling that one person with, with three tests, they're calling that three positive cases. Yes, is that accurate? Also, also, uh, actually, and yet, and, and and even in England, they early on had to report how they were counting each test twice for some reason. So every test was so you, that doubled right there. I mean, I and I'm actually working on a book about this right now as we speak. So uh, I, this is all fresh in my mind, yeah. and it's uh, I I call it the greatest psyop of all time, because basically the world, the entire world, with a few exceptions like Belarus and uh, uh, to some degree Sweden, right some degree Brazil, uh, the rest of the world, and this is, you know, you talk about the, the, I, one of the biggest arguments against conspiracy I hear all the time is, oh, you can't get people to come together. Well, in this case, they got the entire world to come together. For sure. And what's saddest about it is that it happened, it really, within a matter of a couple of weeks, the world was shut down, will never be the same again without a shot being fired. There were no troops needed. There were no police needed. Everyone did this willingly because they played on the fear factor. And this is, is the most dangerous uh, conspiracy of all is what is going on here because they, they, I think they finally figured that nothing motivates the average person more than a fear for their health mm -hmm. and their safety. So they're willing to say and do anything. You have people scurrying around in mass. You have people doing this nonsensical social distancing, which, as I understand, they just kind of arbitrarily picked the number out of six feet. Yeah. Out of their they have, I mean, there's, so the virus can't go seven feet. I mean, it's, just, it's the dumbest thing ever, and you're seeing not only uh, – I, I just posted something tonight on, on social media about uh, uh, the evictions that are going to begin in August. Mm -hmm. We can't even imagine the economic devastation, how many people are going to be thrown out on the streets. The economic repercussions of this alone are unimaginable, and uh, no one seems to care. I mean no one seems to be looking at the big picture is that you, what, look what you've created, and we're never going to come back from this. 100,000 businesses, very conservatively, right. are gone forever. Uh, you, know, you know what it takes to start a business and, and start up money and so forth. Uh, that's not an easy thing to do. And millions of people have been thrown out of work. It's, this is just a horrific situation, and really for nothing. We don't know when schools are going to open back up. You see sports. Right. Uh, they started back up, and clearly I don't think they're going to be able to make a go of it because they're continuing to test nonstop. And the, the, these tests have already been shown to have an 80% false positive rate. No one seems to have people that have shrugged that off, but they're responding to every positive test the baseball player gets. And for all we know, because we weren't being tested for the coronavirus before, most a lot of people say the coronavirus is the common cold. So right. who knows what what would have been the, the if they had done this to everyone in the past? Ninety percent of us might have tested, even though we have no symptoms, we're feeling fine. But so this is going to, I think, going to wreck sports. Uh, they're already taught. I'm reading today. So many NFL players are dropping like flies, saying they're opting out of the season. You're going to see huh. this over and over again. And, uh, and that's just one thing. Are movies? Are people ever going to go to the to, to uh, movies again? These actors. So. And these, that's just kind of the entertainment aspect. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those people have enough money, but restaurants, servers, I mean, they have opened up to at least on a kind of a part time basis or whatever, or where you certain amount of seating and all that social right. distancing nonsense. But who knows how many people lost their jobs that weren't high paying to, to begin with. And I suspect that we already have rumblings in Virginia here 
where uh, we're, I think on stage three, we're starting to reopen, but they've already backtracked on the schools. Now my county school system, they're, they're not going to be open this year. Uh, Bill Gates wants to have schools closed till 2021. I, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't, it, I don't, and I don't see any long range plan. I don't see any, just as with the protest on top of it across the country where you have looting and statues being torn down and authorities, the same authorities that are tyrannizing us into healthy people quarantining themselves and wearing masks and keeping six feet apart from each other. These same authorities that we're listening to are incapable of stopping violent crime and <laughs> statues being torn down. So what, what, <laughs> what, what are we paying them for? It's a, it's a, and I don't see a single leader out there that is that is standing up and trying to be reasonable and acting like a statesman and saying look this is absurd we never uh, we never shut down for the flu however right. you look, even, even with the fake numbers and i and they definitely are wildly inflated not only you talked about uh, having anyone that is uh, even if you're in a car wreck if you test a positive coronavirus that's what they're and they're, both the WHO the CDC and Dr. Burke for the White House uh, Corona Task Force have all said that publicly right. so they're telling you that but early on, I published the, uh, the directive to hospitals from the CDC, and it went out, I think, in March or April, and I, I made a big deal out of it because it says right there in black and white that you're, it, it tells hospitals to list the cause of death as COVID, even where tests were unavailable or uh, even when tests were unavailable. So even you don't, you don't know they had it. Because it's presumed that when I had John Rappaport on my show, he's done a lot of great work, uh, no more fake news dot com. Mm -hmm. Probably done the best work out there. He's a wonderful guy, uh, and he's been on this from the beginning. And he first told me on my show, and I verified it, uh, that they are, have been counting from the beginning what they call presumed cases. In other words, untested cases. And if you look at the CDC sends out a directive every week with updated death stats and they vary wildly sometimes they'll lower them and bring them back and again nobody questions it right and uh they say right on there they have a little disclaimer asterisk uh presumed cases are included here so which means they're including cases for which the patients weren't tested and it isn't proven so i don't see how you can trust any of this but this is the the mess that's out there and other than people like me and john rapaport and you know, on, on shows like yours this is the only, uh, to some degree, Tucker Carlson, who kind of questions mm -hmm. a little of it. He nibbles around the edges of it, but he doesn't go that far. Uh, there's nobody questioning this. No politicians, or other than Ron Paul, who's not in Congress anymore. But everyone else is on board with this, and they're saying, you know, we must have a vaccine. And as if, and you know, nobody questions that. The, we've had a flu vaccine forever, and people still get the flu. Right. It's, it's not overly effective. Well, that's the yeah. that is the problem. You cannot speak out. It's just a, that's the bigger problem of society in general. You cannot speak out against the mainstream or the mainstream will eat you. So if you speak out against and say, hmm, uh, I think these numbers are inflated. I think uh, you maybe should take those infection numbers and count them and cut them by 70 percent and say that this is probably the actual number of people who are infected. You should probably take those death rates and cut them by 50%. These are a number of people who have actually potentially died. People will die from, from illness. Um, would, but I, I mean, I actually said that to someone is they were, they were, you know, railing. They were in almost in a, in a emotional fervor about what was going on. And I said, well, if I told you that, that 400,000 cases is actually 100,000 cases and those, you know, 1 million deaths is actually 200,000 deaths, would it be as impactful? Is it, is it as important? Uh, but they don't even have to do the policing of that. They have us to do it for them. They have the, the masses who, again, to your point, is an emotional issue. They are, they are the control. They will control those who step out of line. They don't have to have the police to do it. They don't have to have the armed guards come and do it. Uh, common everyday people will, will make sure that, why aren't you wearing your mask? Why are you seven feet from me? Uh, you you may be a you may be an um, a carrier without symptoms. Well, that means I'm that means I'm healthy, right? <laughs> I'm sorry if I don't have symptoms, I'm healthy. So right. I don't get it. But they're doing they're doing the work for them. It's the greatest thing in the world. They don't have to come and physically do anything to you. It's just the threat is good enough. So Absolutely. What do you think? What is the purpose? What is the purpose of doing this? Is it? about the election are they really trying is it really a matter of trying to ruin the economy at this point to, to overthrow uh, the current president and install a new one 
What do you think is the reason? Well, I, I think that's what the, uh, the the supporters of Trump believe. Sure. And on the surface, there's a cer there's a, there's a certain amount of uh, you know anecdotal evidence that looks like that. But I, I've been you know very disappointed in Trump. I don't mm -hmm. I don't think he's done. He just basically tweets. He doesn't do much of anything, and uh, he tweets a strong game. He you know a lot of times, yeah. but oh, yeah. uh, he doesn't do much. He backtracks constantly, but and, and never really does. People and his cult that I call him his cult really don't seem to notice. But I said when he was elected, which I did not see coming at all. At all. I never saw that happening. I'm still in shock from that. I said at the time, he's our last hope. Mm -hmm. He's still our last. That's as bad as bad as it is because I don't think much of him. I think he's basically a buffoon, but he's our last hope because everyone else is either, uh, as far as the Republicans, they are absolutely worthless. They are just a bunch of do-nothings who sit there and, and uh, call them cucks if you want to call them that. Mm -hmm. They apologize for everything that they don't even do. And the Democrats largely are completely out of control. Uh, a lot of them belong in padded rooms. I mean, they're delusional. So we, it's madness out there. And for what's happening now, I have never been able to figure out what the end game here. I, I think on the surface, uh, doing something like this is, is an exercise in uh, just total c control. Something like, uh, you know, George Orwell, so many analogies to 1984 you can draw here, but one, mm -hmm. one of the most... Uh, you know, uh, memorable was when he said, if you want to see a future of the human race, picture a, a, a boot stepping on a human race forever. And, uh, you know, and I, I think that, you know, is this just, a, a, you know, to, to see, okay, what can we get them to do? Is Are they just playing and saying, okay, uh, you have to start wearing purple hats now in public? I don't know. You have to go naked every Tuesday? I, Because I at this point, I don't see the, the, the people that are wearing those masks. And and a, most of them are have Trump derangement syndrome, as I call it. They're just you know they're they've completely deluded by it. They Absolutely. somehow, including lots of people that read my book Hidden History, which was written before Trump and doesn't mention Trump in it. Right. But a, a lot of these people, people who interviewed me on their shows, who wrote glowing reviews of it, have ended up deleting me as a friend on Facebook. <laughs> won't talk to me anymore because of Trump. Because they, I mean, again, I I'm one of the few that's I'm an agnostic on Trump. I, I really, you know, I don't hate or love him. I think he's a big nothing, but yeah. uh, these people are, and I said, yeah, you just want to go back to the way it was you know, before, before 2016, what I wrote about in history, which you agreed with. And they seem to have forgotten that as, as if the Donald Trump has represented some, something new. I mean, the only thing new he's represented is he had some revolutionary rhetoric in his campaign, mm -hmm. and and he has largely done nothing. I I can't find a body count for the guy, which maybe you include Epstein if he's really dead, but he could be yeah. part of the Clinton body count too. Uh, other than that, I I you know he doesn't have the kind of scandals behind him that all these other and that that doesn't mean he's good because I'm sure he's 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 you know he's corrupt and all that, but he does not have the same kind of record. That these other people had. People hate it when I say that. The people that hate him. Oh, how can you? Well, what what is he? And then they'll make you know come up with the Ukraine phone yes. call and nonsense like yes. that. <laughs> like, it's not on the same par with the you know with Waco or something like that. You know. I mean, I thought I feel like you could almost feel the earth shake on on the night when uh, we were watching the the election results, and depending on what station you watched, if you watched Fox. You saw their you saw their eyes start to widen and their and their smiles like a like a Cheshire yeah, yeah. cat grin yeah. come on and they're like oh my god he's going yeah. to win and then yeah. if you and, and then if you go to CNN complete denial you know no yeah. they they waited to call Florida until like one o'clock in the morning on CNN but they you know right. he had won Florida by nine thirty and right. and I think that most people feel exactly the way you felt was that he was the only hope at that time. How yeah. do you put the absolute worst candidate for president ever uh, on, on that ticket and just assume she's going to win? Uh, I mean, yeah. even even Biden now, and I and I do feel for Biden because I do think that Biden Biden's mental faculties are, are starting yeah. to erode. I just think it's a yeah. it's a matter of time. It's he's a he's an older man. It happens, but I think he's there, and I think that if anybody who honestly thinks that he is going to be competently leading the country is Deluding themselves, he has right. he his best bet is to stay hidden in a bunker. And I wouldn't be surprised if they have this whole coronavirus thing going just so he doesn't have to campaign, yes, just so yes. he doesn't have to debate, because yes. if he debates Donald Trump, he will die on stage. They yes. will Donald exactly. Trump will eat him on stage. So yeah. 
I wouldn't be because you do see a lot of that that frenzy, that demarcation line right at political party. I I live in Florida. Florida, for the most part, is what have been one of the more aggressive reopening states. You know, aggressive with their actions. Or or you go to California and they they basically never reopened. They've been shut down pretty much the entire time, just kind of based on on political lines. So I mean, I could see it, but then why would you put Biden there again? Uh, there has to be yeah. had to be sense. better candidates there. Absolutely, um, any of them. Well, as far as it's just as far as competency, yes. being able to talk. I mean, they're all diluted. But uh, I I gave up after Trump was elected. I I said I'm not making any more political predictions because <laughs> obviously I I didn't I, I didn't understand that, and I still don't. And uh, but now I'm beginning to believe that he was put in place to divide the country with his personality, mm. and he's he certainly succeeded in that. But I can't begin to tell you what's going to happen next. On the surface, it certainly looks like they want him out, but yes. I think they put him in. So, and I can't believe Biden is the guy they want in because oh, they seem goodness. to want to take they seem to want to take the next step and just have you know a real like a you know a black transgender or something as president something right. really you know outlandish in in that you know world of identity politics and Biden's an all white guy so i i don't understand it i i i did not think he would be so i i have no idea what's going to happen i and i and while they sweep read, that under the rug too right i mean the every one of them during the primaries were campaigning for well, I'm the only black male up on the stage. I'm the right, only black right, female up right. on stage. I'm the only American Indian up on stage, if you want to believe Elizabeth right. Warren. Right. But then they still went with the old white guy. Yeah. When it all came right down to it, it came down to, to Bernie and Biden, the old yep. white guys. Uh, exactly. you know, Forget Yang, forget uh, Tulsi Gabbard, forget Amy yes. Klobuchar, any of those others who, who I all would have thought would have been better than Biden. That's, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I, <laughs> Because I'm, I'm with you. I am with you 100%. I voted for Trump, not for Trump. Um, and in reality, I did not vote for him in the primaries. I voted for others in the primaries. Uh, but I've – and that just kind of goes towards the two-party system. And boy, did I wish there was a, an ability for a libertarian candidate to go up there and, and be a part of the process, a Green Party, to be a part of the process. Well, I, we, need, we, need, we need that so badly. And, and I, we, never have we needed it. But the problem is – the one thing Trump accomplished, and I don't think it's a, a good accomplishment, <laughs> but uh, he succeeded in uh, forever killing any independent mm. political party because the country is – except for people maybe like you, certainly like me, where we really uh, are you – know, we don't really care that much about Trump. I think he's largely insignificant yeah, except I agree for his with bluster. He's, he's clearly not in charge. I mean anybody that looks at him with Dr. Fauci standing in front of him. I mean, he, he clearly has no idea what's going on with whatever this virus thing is because he, he doesn't, you know, he said it's a hoax. He's, uh, you know, he's kind of talking about, we, we don't need a vaccine. And then he's bragging about vaccines. So he's not even in the loop. They're telling him what to say, but however you look at it, uh, we, we, what he has done is the people that might have, let's say, I have, I'm fond of saying if Hillary Clinton is, is the queen of corruption, you know, maybe the most evil person that ever went the, entered the White House if she got in there. Oh, boy. Uh, we certainly would have, you know, we didn't want that. But if she had, it might have been better for the future because she would have tried so many horrible things probably. <laughs> that, uh, you, you, would, you, would have, you would have had a real independent movement. A lot of the Bernie Sanders people who were so yeah. ticked off when she stole the nomination from him. He, Bernie Sanders wasn't, of course. He was fine with it. <laughs> but uh, and, and the people that eventually voted for Trump. The end, and you might have been able – that could have coalesced into a Ross Perot-like uh, independent movement because Trump essentially was like Perot. Trump is not I, – I, he was the first Republican I ever voted for, and I don't think he's a Republican. His, the Republican Party hates him. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> he's, I, he's, he's more of an independent, but I – without Donald Trump, the Republican Party because of decades worth of – I call – I used to call the Republicans the stupid party and the Democrats the evil party. They have a choice between stupid and evil, and the Republicans are getting more stupid by the day with what they're doing now. But they, through a series of incredibly stupid moves, going back to Reagan especially on immigration mm -hmm. and uh, outsourcing industry, awful trade deals, things like this, through terrible decisions with the Republicans never fought on at all. They let the Democrats lead the way, and then there's this new authoritarian left, which are not classical liberals at all like I am. But they let them have – and they're still not. You see what's going out there. Who Who is driving this narrative? 
whether it's the pandemic or the protests, the left is driving the narrative, the new yes. left. And there is no blowback other than Trump's occasional tweets and his rallies. That's it. There no, there's not a single Republican standing up strong saying, wait a minute, this is insanity. You know, you're trying, but we've got to this point. Well, they, because... built the, they built the foundation first, though. They built the foundation with the thought police, and you cannot have a dissenting opinion. You cannot say something that's against the, the mean or we'll dox you or we will get you canceled or we will get you fired if you do something outside of, right. you know, if you're at a bar and you say something, you know, rude to someone, they can get you fired for that. They'll post you all Absolutely. over Facebook and you lose your, your livelihood over something like that. So. These people, all, they, all they're really working towards anyway is re-election, for the most part, all of them. If we had term limits, maybe they could go in there and say, well, I've only got four years anyway. Right. I'm going to get something done. But this is a life choice for Pelosi and, and you know, Biden. And, you know, sure, right. AOC, she's expecting she's going to be there for 50 years. So, <laughs> so they're working and, towards re-election. So they can't say these things because, wow, if I inflame some portion of rural Kentucky, you know, right. I, I may not get— Reelected. Well, and, and I, th I think that again, that because of their failure to stand up to uh, any of this, I mean, any, any of this push, it's constantly. It's like I, I wrote *Bullyocracy*, a book about bullying, so I'm familiar with bullies. And mm -hmm. what is happening now is that establishment, which is again, they're not my kind of left where I was, and then uh, they're not classical liberals, they're not populists. They are authoritarians. They're more like fascists right. or Marxists, if you want to call them that. But they're pushing and pushing and pushing, and until they meet resistance, they're going to keep pushing. They are meeting no resistance, and so these Republicans are worthless, and they deserve what they're going to get. And if, if the votes are remotely counted, you know, I I don't know that they are. I mean, I've written enough about elect, and certainly wasn't from Russia. <laughs> We've had a lot right. of elect, electoral fraud going back to landslide Lyndon Johnson in, in 1948, or before even, but. The Republicans are such a pathetic group now, and they, the demographics of America have changed so much because of their idiotic subservience to this ridiculous open-door policy on immigration and the millions and millions of illegals out there that are they want to be able to vote. So they, by allowing that and by just being so enthralled with cheap labor, because that's what it meant to them, without Absolutely. cheap labor, that's a... They've destroyed the country and they've destroyed their party because except in a few pockets, maybe Wyoming, Colorado, places, South Dakota. Other than that, I think you're going to see a blue wave like you've never seen before. I think I think the Democrats are going to take the Senate back easily. And I, I don't think – personally, I think that any Republican candidate, presidential candidate in the future will be lucky to get 30 percent of the vote because they represent nothing. They represent nothing. All, all their basic argument is tax cuts for the wealthy. That's that's really the only, and that's that's a great sell. Mm -hmm. They don't care about working class people. The reason Trump was elected was because he didn't sound like that. He had populist rhetoric, and he talked about the awful trades deals, building up the infrastructure, ending the senseless wars, things that no other Republican talks about. And so, we this this is it. Like so, this is the last hope. Because otherwise, you're going to have. I mean, can you imagine Marco Rubio or? Uh, I, I don't know, somebody like him or, or Jorge Bush or whatever the guy, the guy is in, mm -hmm. uh, George Bush's grandson or something. These are just imagine those kind of campaigns. It's going to be they're going to be trying to out virtue signal the other. And it's uh, it's it's we're but, a long way removed from our republic. But I, I honestly I do personally think, though, that I don't think that liberals are, are doing themselves any favors by burning cities down. I no. think that that is. I think I think you're right. I think if they had done nothing and just let Trump tweet, then then uh, I could see that happening. But I think as long as they continue to burn their cities down, as long as they continue to, to not do anything about homeless on the side of the road, defecating on the road, you know, right. Right. No, as long as you can see in visual form this and see how 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 crazy it has become with 93 genders. It's amazing how COVID is only affecting two genders though it's only affecting a male or female <laughs> That's so, right. but but i think that all of those things they're shooting themselves in the foot i do i think though i think that there is still the that that underlying set of people who aren't going to run their mouths on facebook who aren't going to yeah. virtue signal on facebook who aren't going to take that to the streets they're going to say okay well i'm going to go here and i'm going to vote 
And I think that's oh, I actually I, think that's I, what happened to Trump. That's why Trump won. Those well, people aren't I mean, going to answer polls. They're not going to say, I'm going to vote for Trump on a poll, because that would cause shame. They're just going to go and do it. <laughs> that's the ho I think that's the hope that a lot of us have, is that yeah. there is still enough of a silent majority out there. I don't know that there is. I really don't. I mean, I, I just... <laughs> I can't take much hope with the way this this pandemic has been going because very few people. You saw a few protests for a while on the yeah. lockdowns, but uh, they were kind of ineffectual. Of course, they were they were criticized. Uh, you're not social. And as soon as the the Black Lives Matters came in, then it, it doesn't okay. matter. Right. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Somehow the virus doesn't. But if it really runs wild at Trump rallies, though, it can't get through to Black Lives Matters protests. But uh, uh, Trump rallies, absolutely. Yeah. So, so let me ask you this. So. To, to go back to these some of these other um, crimes and cover-ups, what part, because to me, almost all of this is, is media-driven. All of this this pandemic that we have going on right now is media-driven. So, and depending on what you watch, if you're watching Fox or you're watching CNN, they, they have a, a ridiculous slant one way or the other. Uh, when, did, when did the media become so actively a part of the story? And I know that Throughout history, you know, uh, William Randolph Hearst, they were writing stories that were just blatantly right. false. But to me, it seemed like back in the day when I was when I was younger, the media was exposing were exposing these type of things, and it, and it was it was a badge of courage to find that story and to be able to publish that story. And now they are just running and hiding from the truth. When did that happen? Well, I, I think there, the, if there's an underlying theme to everything I write, it's uh, my condemnation of what I, I think we have a state-sponsored media. I think it's mm. a state. I, I think we're every. The only difference between what we have in the mainstream media and TASS and Pravda at the height of the Soviet Union is that the Soviet citizens were astute enough to recognize they were being lied to by state-controlled media. Most Americans still look at CNN and things like, and they actually think these are journalists. They think Chris right. Cuomo and Don Lemon are journalists, and this is the problem that uh, that we have. I, there's there are no investigative. Otherwise, I couldn't have written the books I've written or write the things because it would, you would have investigative journalists that work for powerful and have you know real great resources that we don't. They have. would have already done it, right? Exactly. Yeah. would have already done it. They would have exposed these things. And once you start exposing, there's a domino effect. Once you start exposing the truth about the JFK assassination, it leads to, it leads to the RFK assassination, the MLK assassination, the death of JFK Jr. That's just one case. And, uh, you know, you, you, you expose the truth about Waco and, and Ruby Ridge, and it leads to Oklahoma City and so and, and a whole difference. And eventually 9-11. These things are all intertwined because they're all part of the same mass of corruption. But what they all share in common is uh, uh, just a startling reluctance on the part of the mainstream media to do any investigating at all. In fact, what they do, they save all their skepticism for people like us, where, you know, we, uh, you know and they'll point figures and they'll, mm -hmm. they'll do some investigating if they can there. So they'll try to, you know, expose anything they can in our background. They'll look at, you know, things I've tweeted, but they can look all they want at somebody like me because everything I say is controversial. So right. They, you know, they're, they're, I mean, that's, I, I'm putting myself out there as that. I don't care. I'm never going to apologize for anything I write. I'm very aware of and saying it. And so uh, I, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to cuck out like these guys do because I'm, you know, I, I'm putting, this is why I believe what I believe. This is why I say what I say. And, uh, you know, I'm not doing anything different behind closed doors. And I actually think just to, to what you're saying right there, I think Trump does that tremendously. He sends, he spits out so yes. much ridiculousness on Twitter that you become yes. uh, noise blind to it. You know, it no longer registers. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, if one of your parents just yells at you constantly, the kids stop listening <laughs> to the yell. It doesn't matter anymore. So, yeah. you know, and, and so the, the Democrats will keep and say, well, what about this? What about this? Eh, whatever. He, it's right. been thrown so much at you that you right. no longer smell it anymore. It's gone. Um, so, I mean, that, that is not, I guess that's one way of, um, you know, being above that type of investigation. Everything I say is controversial. Everything I say, to, you know, starts right, to fire. Exactly. Yeah, it, it, it is. But I, I think that so, I, to answer your question, though, I kind of, yeah. uh, about when I think, I mean, I, I I don't think the media has ever been really good on any of these issues. Certainly my book, Crimes and Cover-Ups, but earlier uh, will show you that they certainly didn't do themselves uh, justice, you know, or things like the Lindbergh kidnapping and things like that. Mm -hmm. they, they really didn't do any investigating there at all. But I think the media really became, I, I, I'm fond of saying that the, the 90s, when, with, when Bill Clinton was elected, 
I think that's when you saw classical liberalism die because he was a new kind of neoliberal kind of, and uh, he he didn't pretend to care about the traditional liberal issues of po- peace, mm-hmm. uh, you know, working class wages, uh, the rights of prisoners against capital punishment, things traditional liberal issues, uh, big labor. He didn't he didn't make a pretense of unions or anything like that. But he was the first virtue signaling president. He felt your pain, as he said. I feel your pain, and that's when I think the left became uh, imbued with this uh, identity politics, where it's all about emotion. And, and and from that time on, it's just gotten worse. Certainly under Obama, it 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 went through the roof because the whole Obama was worshipped and revered for what he was—a half black president. Right. And it didn't matter what he said. In fact, he could talk, speak smoothly, and. Uh, you know, play, shoot baskets in the way or something. This, this was it was a thing. Like they treated him like a pet, and it didn't matter that you know it was business as usual. He had a huge body count, as I wrote about in history. Uh, he, he bragged about killing people. He was bombing, I think, seven countries at one time. He didn't end torture, close down Guantanamo Bay. He didn't build the infrastructure. He did nothing to raise the minimum wage or help workers at all. But he was perfect for uh, social justice warriors right? because he looked the way they wanted to look. And so much of this, again, going back to Bill Clinton, is built on this uh, anti-white stuff. And and so many are pushing it are white people, which I don't understand. It's a very, very curious phenomenon where you have whites (laughs) screaming about white pride. I don't don't get it. I mean, most people don't know only 16% of the membership in Black Lives Matter are black. I mean, exactly. What yeah. is, I don't even know what that means, but it's pretty bizarre, you know, if you think about it. So we're, we're living in strange times, but I think the media was so enamored. I think that's at that time you had a lot of people like Clinton and were younger that were even younger than Bill Clinton, ex hippies mm-hmm. that had entered journalism. Maybe they were inspired by Woodward and Bernstein and Watergate and all that. And uh, I think at that time, so you ha- you end up having ridiculous things like, I mean, the, the media, and I wrote about that in Hidden History, they were embarrassing the way they fawned over Bill Clinton. And they made, you know, they made, uh, you know, excuse after excuse. And you had somebody like Nina Burley, who was still out there as, and, and is taken seriously as a reporter, who said she wanted to give down and give the president a blowjob oh, for keeping abortion legal. I mean, this is not to mention what a degrading thing is for alleged feminist. Right. And then she told all the other women, get, get you, you need to get your presidential knee pads out, too. So it's like, you know, what what, what kind of a feminist says that? And uh, just because of that. And of course, that's when, again, the the ultimate uh, politically correct issue for the today's left is abortion. Uh, and, and that's uh, become such a divisive issue, but mm-hmm. it kind of heads the culture war and the I think that we, we turned from economic issues that used to define the left to uh, cultural issues, and uh, where suddenly then that's you get the push and the push and the push, so you end up with a, you know 57 genders or whatever, because there's no stopping it. Right. And and next you're gonna they they will probably try to mainstream pedophilia. They kind of already are. They are yeah they are doing that yeah. now. Yeah. So, and there's and there's again there's no reason for them to stop because they they aren't meeting any resistance, and you know, the bullies don't stop. They keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And uh, what should be put, it shouldn't be on, uh, you know, upon uh, com- incumbent upon us to push back. It should be, again, our leaders. And, uh, you know, where where is this? I, I've written a lot on, uh, you know, the, the, the gist of the Black Lives Matters and Antifa argument is that there's systemic racism and we're being run by white supremacists and white privilege. Well, why is every, I mean, every organ in our establishment not only publicly supports Black Lives Matter and Antifa, but gives huge amounts of money to them. That's a strange thing for white racists to be doing right. to people that are condemning them. Uh, so again, but nobody looks at it that way. They just look it's like, you know, what, what, where is the evidence of this? There's, there's no evidence at all. There's systemic corruption, yes, and that's what you. But, but to call that out. That requires a little digging, and it's different. And that's why I, I quibble all the time with people online about racism and all that stuff. And I said, you know, this is, once you start saying something's racist, you've lost it because there is a huge problem with police. Mm-hmm. There's police corruption and there's, but as soon as you say racist, you've turned people off because it's not racism that's doing it. It's policing for profit. It's the corrupt system that does need to be reformed, but you're not going to reform it by saying you can't arrest any black people. 
that's not the way to do it. And that's the way they want to reform it. That's why this movement is pushing it. And um, again, nobody's talking sense and there's nobody. And the, the other side, when there is any resistance, they apologize and stutter. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the CEO of Chick-fil-A, who's supposedly conservative, says white people should be, sh- you know, shining black people's shoes. I mean, just incredible subservient kneeling. When you, we had police and National Guard out there kneeling with these people and it's like we, you know they they want to they want to defund you right what are you kneeling for i mean i i don't understand any of it it's madness if anybody had told me a year ago that this would be where we'd be i, I would not have believed it but I, I this is this is and i you know now they're talking about um they're suddenly bringing up ufos another interest of mine uh, and, and finally, talking about how the government, you know, has known for decades that there's alien technology, which I don't think there is, but there is a phenomenon there. Mm-hmm. I think it's another government project. But a lot of us in the conspiracy world have been joking for years about, are, are they going to stage a fake alien invasion? I think that may be next. I don't know why they're suddenly <laughs> talking, because they've done everything else this year. That's so. that's <laughs> if Trump wins November 4th. November 4th, it's yeah. the alien invasion. Yes, yeah. and the Greta Thun, they'll say, take us to Greta Thunberg. And, oh, my uh, goodness. Know, Lecture us on climate change, I guess, but it's, I don't know. I try to keep a sense of humor about it because you have to, otherwise you go crazy. But it's, 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 it's really sad because yeah. uh, I, I, I hate sounding so pessimistic all the time, but I, there's, there's no way I can sound optimistic. Yeah, there really isn't a lot right now to, to say this is the beacon of light right now, um, certainly. But, but throughout history, though, there, there have been these conspiracies and cover-ups as well. And, you know, it's just interesting how, you know, they're, they're talking Ukraine phone calls and they're talking Russian interference. But again, they weren't uh, impeaching George Bush on the weapons of mass destruction, which turned out not to be of it in there. They didn't impeach right. Clinton on a lot of things. They didn't they didn't really make a big deal out of Fast and Furious with Obama. I believe those are a lot of they've all had a lot of dirt that did not come in and say, we're, we're impeaching you over this. But he, you know, now he has a phone call. So let's him, let's impeach him. He won the election, so it must have been somebody else's influence because our polls said that Hillary Clinton was going to win, and so we assumed she yeah. was. I mean, it seems like it's just sour grapes at that point. Um, but when you're looking back at some of those things in the past and you're writing these books, you know, these hidden history books, what are the sources that you're using for these books? What, uh, you know, because history is written by the victors too. You, you know, right. the things that we're being taught in right. school is right. are the victors' versions of what actually happened. How are you finding the truth? Well, there, there, it's not hard to find. It's, it's out there, mm-hmm. and it's and mostly. I try to use mainstream sources because they'll, they'll ridicule you if you don't. No doubt. Yeah. And, and so I try whenever possible to use. Now, sometimes it's in personal interviews. I've talked to some of these people uh, for hidden history, especially. I had to use a feisty little newspaper called the Spotlight, which was condemned as anti-Semitic, but they did a lot of great work. And sometimes they were the only source for some of these stories. But I mean, they interviewed people that you were there and think that no one else interviewed. Now I'm now writing a disclaimer. I write for the American free press regularly, which is, uh, was, is the old spotlight basically. And they give me a forum and you know, they don't tell me anything right, but I, I write pretty much every uh, issue for them. So, uh, and I think it's the last independent newspaper in, in America, but in researching these things, uh, you just basically, what we what I look at is how these same thing. I, I'm using the same sources that a lot of the establishment, what I call court historians, use. Mm-hmm. The problem is they twist it and they interpret it in in, in their way. But they're trying to. I, I don't have an agenda. So for when, when, for instance, when I'm writing about the Civil War, the war between the states yeah. and, and crimes and cover-ups, I can find Southern sources. I can find. I, I can look at Union letters that they try to suppress. Like I, I make a big deal out of the letter of uh, Lieutenant uh, Thomas Myers, who was a, a Union soldier, who wrote home bragging to his family. I mean, these, these are hidden in plain sights about the graft that was going on. Actually, he was bragging, but he was complaining because he was saying the officers are taking too big a cut of all the property we're stealing, the jewelry. Mm-hmm. And he, he specifically mentioned General Sherman, who I think is the greatest war criminal of all time, uh, and how much of a cut he was. He said he has enough gold and silver to, to open a bank. And he, this is to me, that is precious firsthand evidence right. because this is a guy who was actually complaining about it. He wasn't trying to expose anything, and he had no. He wasn't like trying to. You know, so, and he, he says at the end, "Please don't show this out of the family." And so, uh, you know, I, but that's the kind of thing Ken Burns is not going to have in his, his civil war because it doesn't fit his narrative. 
that the North were good and the South was bad. And I just try to show, you know, again, using Southern sources, you can show some of the, the, the incredible atrocities the North committed. And later, you know, in, in World War II, the same kind of thing where uh, it's out there in, we, we know they bombed Dresden and killed something like 39,000 toddlers or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, just imagine that. It, it, it had no military significance at all. Destroyed one of the most uh, beautiful cities in the world, uh, priceless works of art, churches, things like that. This is an allegedly Christian nation that did that, the good guys. Uh, and I'm not, not to mention bombing a Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I right. talk a lot about the, the, the rapes that were – I mean the, 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 the uh, American troops were raping so many women in Japan that they had to open a big brothel for them. To stop them. I mean, so this is they raped tons of Germans and women as well. If this is a matter of record, I mean, I didn't get it from, uh, you know, the uh, the American Nazi Party. I mean, it's out there. You can find it in the New York Times and sources like that. It's just the court historians don't reference it mm -hmm. because it doesn't. Instead, they go back and reference the same kind. And I, as I write, you know, this is, I'm not taking up for the Nazis or the Confederates. My point is that uh, you all – there's been plenty written about the atrocities and alleged atrocities of of the bad guys in the Civil War and World War II. I'm just trying to show that uh, the good guys weren't good. And, and there is no, as Benjamin Franklin said, and I quote this all the time, there's no such thing as a good war or a bad peace. There are very few people that believe that now. I believe it. And uh, I try to point that out with everything I write. So I look back at history, and you're right, history is written by the victors. Mm -hmm. And people seem to forget that. And they just imagine how different things would be if, uh, certainly, if Hitler had won, we have no idea what the world would look like. But certainly, the history books would read quite a bit differently. And same thing with the, if the southern states had been successful. I, I don't know if they would still have an independent uh, country or whatever, but certainly Lincoln would be looked at quite a bit differently that way. So I. I'm I'm not I don't have really an axe to grind. I, I am somewhat of a obviously I'm a revisionist to, to some degree, and uh, I don't know maybe I just uh, like to uh, to take the other side sometimes. But I, I I'm just trying to look for for truth, and I think that uh, history is as Napoleon said, history is a fable agreed upon, and I think that's largely what it is. So when we're writing about history. It's important because. The court historians are the gatekeepers to the past, and I think you see the same things to these historical events that we see in, modern, in current events, the way the mainstream uh, media, the reporters, uh, alter the facts the exact same way. Well, and it's the same thing with the, the Southern, the Confederate statues. And, you know, I, I live in Florida, so I'm, but I'm from Ohio originally, so I've kind of been on both sides of it. And so I see you know, people saying, this is my history, this is my history. And, and then you'll say, well, your history, we're traitors and, and you're traitors to the mm -hmm. Union. But in reality, we were traitors at the Revolution. We were, we were doing a traitorous act revolting against the British. To me, they were ultimately American by saying, we don't like the way the system is working right now. We are going to stand up for, to, for ourselves for that and rebel, regardless of whether or not they win or lose they were doing something to me that's ultimately incredibly American. And I don't see why people cannot be proud of the fact that they were American in their ideals and said, we don't like what's happening here, just like we didn't at the revolution, and we'll, and we'll fight you for it. You know, they just happened to lose that one. So I, I didn't, I never understood why there was such vitriol against them. You know, they're traitors. They need to have all their statues down. We should erase them from the history books. Why? They were doing what we had done 100 years earlier, right. the exact well, they, same they, thing. They, and they've managed you're, – you're exactly right. I mean we, we seceded from Great Britain. That's right. the exact same thing. And, and you could look at all the quotes I have in Crimes and Cover-Ups from Thomas Jefferson and others that uh, clearly uh, Thomas Jefferson, any time a people that has uh, you know, uh, no longer agrees to the government, they have a right to uh, alter or abolish it. And most people feel – and the reason why we don't talk about the Founding Fathers much except to condemn them now is mm -hmm. racist. Yeah. For sure, is because and they, they own slaves, and that's that's the only issue. That's it. The, the timeless <laughs> argument, you know, that 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 the, these beautiful form of government that they came up with, and it revolved around the primary concept was the consent of the governed, that all people everywhere have a right to consent to those who govern. And the colonists didn't consent to Great Britain running uh, governing them anymore. They fought a war to prove it, and the one percenters of their day, uh, really, really did risk their fortunes. 
and their lives. Some of them died. A lot of them fought personally. They weren't sitting behind desks. They, they, they walked the walk. I mean, General Washington was in the field. George Washington was, was out there exactly. leading the troops. Absolutely. And, they, and these, these were no uh, armchair warriors or chicken hawks. And most of them lost substantial t- uh, amount of money for their families and so forth. So they did pay a huge price. So we, we and I just, you know, really get ticked off because we have any heroes in history. It should be those founding fathers. But they, when they set up the consent of the government, that was lost forever when Abraham Lincoln decided to crush the secession movement. Because, and again, no matter, and I firmly believe that the southern states would be looked at as the little plucky underdog they were in reality, Mm -hmm. and they would be sympathized with if you factor out slavery. But you can't do that. And so slavery, even though the northerners I've shown over and over again in my books and the quotes where every by today's standards, virtually every white man alive in the 1860s was was a vile racist. By the way, we look at it today. There's no evidence that Southerners were any more uh, prejudiced against blacks than Northerners were. There's no evidence that, regardless of what the South was fighting for, slavery may have been a factor, but I don't mm-hmm. think it was a primary factor at all. The North was not fighting to end slavery. No question about that. They did not. Those boys would not have done that. Have risked their lives for that because they all were racist by today's standard. But what was lost, as the great populist Lord Acton said, uh, one of my heroes, the guy who, who came up with the great quote, the power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, our, absolutely. He was a good friend of Robert E. Lee, not Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah. And he rode back and forth to Robert E. Lee over and over. He was rooting for the Confederates, and he, he was in, in consulate after uh, the, the South lost. So he said, you know, what we lost there cannot even be measured. And what we lost in, in America, we lost the entire reason, the rationale for the for the revolution and the war for independence, the founding of the country. And that was the consent of the government because clearly the South no longer consented in 1860. Right. Our government crushed it and it sent the clear message is you – this is not a consent of the government. I don't care if you – we don't care if you consent or not. You have to stay in the union. There's no, there's nothing in the Constitution or any, that say, that say that says a state has to stay in the union. That's just just as they have provisions to add states to the union. If people wanted to leave, they had every right to do it. All the founders said that. But you can't separate the slavery issue. And so I get in arguments with people, and it's everything. And they, they love to throw the word traitor out and all that stuff. Yeah, and it's absolutely. all because of slavery. It's all and the same thing with World War II. You can't rationally discuss that because you have the Jewish question in there. And the Holocaust and all that. that, and so it ends up, you know, oh, you're you love Nazis, and it's like, no, this is this is not. I'm not defending anybody. I'm just pointing out that they're not good guys here, and especially in the case of the Civil War, I think a lot of the problems we see today still are as a result of the original cultural divide, which came out of that Civil War. That I mean, we don't line up exactly the same way, but it's the same kind of deal. Basically, I I, I think if you looked at it. it Trump supporters today, the real diehard, and a lot of independent people, they, they're they the ones that kind of are a little bit sympathetic to maybe they would have supported the South or they, they would have agreed that they had the right to secede, as I do. But certainly everyone, the majority that hates Trump or just is on the left so far, they, they, you can't even talk to them about issues like that. They're traitors. Not That's all, horrible. Yeah. And, I, and I'm triggered if I see a Confederate statue or a Confederate flag. There was a Confederate flag in my neighborhood that I, I was amazed at because I live in a a nice neighborhood, but it's full of, you know, hate has no home here and now Black Lives Matter signs. And because uh, right. they're basically a lot of liberal federal government workers that live around here. And uh, so when I walk in the neighborhood, I for a long time, I used to see this American flag flying next to a Confederate flag in one of the houses. And I, I was amazed. And I wanted I never could find the people. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, I, look, I, it doesn't matter what I think about it. You got balls to be flying that, you know, yeah. and uh, it, it was down about maybe three weeks ago, something like that ago. It, it, it's no longer there and scrawled out in front of the house. Black Lives Matter. Take the flag down, please. Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously, I mean, for somebody that had the, you know, the, the strength to, to, to play, uh, put that up, they took it right down. And I, I just think there's because, you know, why are you triggered by a flag? Why are you triggered by a MAGA hat? I mean, there's not a hat in the world that would trigger me. I mean, if somebody's wearing a hat saying Don Jeffries is an idiot, I, you know, I would maybe consider publicity. I mean, I'm just not, I'm not going to be triggered really. I don't, I don't understand, but that's identity politics. 
That's what the new left is. It's all about emotion. How does that right. make me feel? I see that flag and it offends me. And, and that's just because you know, it interferes. You can't have freedom of speech uh, when you have that kind of identity politics because it doesn't go together. You know, when you can come up with a, a concept like hate speech, which is impossible to prove, it's incompatible with free speech. And, but again, most people capitulate to that. There is no such thing as hate speech. Hate's an emotion. And once you try to put an asterisk on it like that, you don't have free speech. But I, I realize I'm, I'm a very small minority right. because there aren't many civil libertarians left, and I'm a civil libertarian. I, I just don't think many people are willing to risk it. Uh, in, in this world of um, video, and every phone is a camera, and right. it, people just don't want to risk it. They've seen too many people now on, on Facebook who maybe had one too many beers and you know, got into a, a verbal confrontation with somebody. Right wasn't physical, wasn't necessarily degrading, maybe said, you know, F you, whatever. Oh, this person did, was rude to me online. Find this guy and have him fired. Yeah, I'm fired. Yeah, uh, exactly. And so you, you, you are no longer able to have civil discourse because you are going to be almost immediately labeled either a racist. That's a very easy card to play. Or you'll be named a conspiracy theorist. And that's almost right. as bad. You know, you are, you are immediately disregarded. Uh, you know, people don't want to talk to you. Well, you're, you're a conspiracy theorist. You're an idiot. You know, and that's it. Right. Um, right. They don't want to hear it because it because it does. It's against their worldview. Um, right. How do your how does your you know, you say you're very outspoken. How does your family deal with <laughs> the, the, your, your views and the things that you say? Well, that's you know, people ask me, they have asked me about that increasingly, uh, you know. I have been. And that's why we talk about trying to awaken people. We like to think yeah. of ourselves as being awake. I have I have a huge family and I have not been very successful at all. The, <laughs> the only the only person I've woken up is my son. He's awake, but uh, my daughter's not. My wife, you know, not really. And I have siblings, tons of nieces and nephews, cousins, and you know, I get a lot. I hear from somebody every day, telling me uh, they either liked one of my books or an article or something. I get you know, some some kind of ego gratification from that every day. And it's never from anybody I know in real life, ever. And uh, I get lots of attention on Facebook, especially. My posts get a lot of attention and comments and likes and shares. But almost all of the attention are from people that I don't know. Even though I'm friends with a lot, I have a lot of family on there. Uh, my own niece deleted me recently okay. as a friend from Facebook. And it's uh, – so, yeah, I haven't – I have not gotten much support at all from people in my family or from – real life friends it's almost all people like i i've become very good friends with people all across i call them my cyber friends and they're my best friends now i feel like i mean i talk to them all the time on the phone and uh i feel i met a few i feel like i know them but uh they're the people that i have you know a bond with that uh, we but the people around me you know we just it's hard for me to talk but now now that i've been published and i i have my little radio show and i do lots of interviews uh, I don't need to rant like I, I used to at family gatherings. It's mm -hmm. just what I did, you know. <laughs> yeah. And maybe they got tired of hearing it. We've been hearing this for decades, but uh, and so many of them have become in my family. You know, so many of them have become social justice warriors, mm -hmm. and a lot of that happened under Obama. A lot of them were triggered by Obama, and they have not looked back. And this is their mindset now, and they just hate Trump, and they know that I have, you know, I've said favorable things about him. So. That's a huge sticking point. Literally, you can't, like around a family thing, you can't mention the name Trump. And that's probably a lot of families now because you know, yeah. there's, it's, it's, so, it's, it's so divisive. But uh, yeah, so to answer your question, unfortunately, I'd like to say that, uh, I mean, they don't really, they just don't talk about it. You know, they don't, I, I've always said like my books and uh, if, you know, whatever my uh, interviews and things like that, they're, uh, they're like giant elephants in the room when I read, they're just, they're never talked about. They don't, they don't mention them. And I, I stopped mentioning them a long time ago because what's the point, you know? So I, I'm coming up on the hour, and I would love to, you know, maybe have another discussion with you. But for now, my last question here today would be, do you see anything on the horizon? I know you're working on another book right now. I mean, outside of what we're doing with, with the coronavirus, do you see another one of these big psyops coming to another uh, cover-up potentially on the horizon that we don't quite know about yet? Well, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not very good at forecasting this anymore, and I certainly did. I, I think what we've seen so far in 2020 is yeah. I hope we're not having any more. Like I said, I, 
you know, I, I'm a little worried about the UFO thing because I, I you know, I mean, I don't think Godzilla is going to come out of the ocean, although I wouldn't be surprised, but uh, at this point, but the, the UFO thing, because I, I don't know why they're suddenly talking about that because they've been very uh, circumspect and kind of covered that up for decades. And given what we've seen so far this year, that worries me a little bit that they might try to throw in this thing and, uh, and use it, you know, throw it on your weapons. You must have climate change and uh, Earthlings. You're, you know, the universe is frowning on you. I don't, I don't know that they would do that, but I didn't think they've done, they would do what they've done mm. so far. This is beyond their normal uh, political skullduggery and conspiratorial activities. When you have something like a, what I call the pandemic, I mean, shut down the whole world, and mm -hmm. I don't see any end game. I, I don't see any end in sight. I don't know what the end game is as far as what their plans are. This apparently. And again, the people that are wearing the masks that are on that on the left today, they they don't want to reopen. They want no. they're desperately clean. And I I don't know what they think are going to happen to the people that don't have jobs. Maybe their eyes will be open next month if all these people get evicted. I don't, but maybe not. I don't I don't think at this point I don't know what they're thinking and what they care about. I think they're only uh, they're just so focused on Donald Trump and, and removing him from office. They don't care about anything else. Well, I think that the expectation is that that the government will continue to bail them out. And they don't have to do anything. They can hide behind their door, and the government will continue to bail you out. They'll provide you with $800 a week of, of free money. I don't know where it's coming from, but it's free <laughs> to you. And, and you can you know, continue to live your life, live behind your, your door, take <laughs> selfies with your mask on, and show everybody that, that, that you are incredibly um, woke and you are you know, yeah. socially uh, aware. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I, around here especially, I, I actually play in a in a band that plays on the weekends. And we played in, in bars and we mm -hmm. played in restaurants. It's just a hobby, you know, something we did on mm -hmm. the weekend. And you, you'd be amazed, you know, the, the the impact that it has had on those people who need their jobs more than, than most. Yes. Uh, yep. You know, not even to mention just these professional professional musicians, people who just go and play in bars. That's what they do for a living. Yeah. You know, you don't even think about those, you know, uh, you know people Absolutely. who work at the restaurants, people who work at the bars. Sure. It has I mean, been an incredible. In, aspiring actors that work in dinner theaters, yes. stand up, stand up comedians, all these people that are trying to make it just. And, and of course, not to mention all the people that are laid off from uh, businesses. But, yeah, there's nobody just just like but the, the left social justice warriors. I tried to talk about that before about, you know, you don't think when you when you get someone fired, you rejoice. Yeah, which is very, you know, very yeah. un empathetic, and you don't think about okay, that person had a family. So what impact does it have on the family? Are they going to lose their home because you had to get them fired because you didn't like what they said? But they they don't think along those lines. It's all about this made me feel good. Right. I got my vengeance or whatever, and which is you know not a liberal position that that ever existed. Before liberals are, you know, were known for super tolerance. You know, what, what did they used to call them? Bleeding hearts. You know, that's what they used to call us. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we were more empathetic. You know, we felt sorry for prisoners, the worst criminals in the world. Well, we could still feel empathy for them. You know, don't be cruel and unusual punishment. Now they want to take somebody that's a you know, middle-aged person has no other job prospects, and because they think they're racist, right? Get them fired. And I. I, yeah. I just, I just think it's, it's just a horrible uh, way to, to lead your life. But this is, this is a reality, and more and more people are, are like that now, or at least are supporting it. I just don't think there's almost anybody that you couldn't find some, you know, rude comment, something in your history. No one is perfect, and I, and I saw something like that where they were saying, "Let's get this guy fired." And yeah. somebody had said, "Oh, that, you know, he can free speech all he wants, but he's not free from repercussions of us." Doxing yes, yes, him yes, and yes, free yes. from us getting him fired, and I yes. said, "Do you think that what he said really validates him losing his livelihood for the rest of his right. maybe for the rest right. of his life? His life is altered forever because yeah. he made you feel bad because you wouldn't give him another beer. Uh, you know, yeah. basically that's what it, well, he was drunk. Come on, uh, you know that 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 punishment does not fit what he did. There was nothing physical there. There were just a couple of words. Um, yeah." But you're right. It, it, so it's uh, it, it's really interesting to me because we are getting to a point where who's perfect? Who's perfect among us? And, and I, right. I do I honestly do think they're going to push that to the point where it's like a rubber band. Eventually, you, you pull it so far that it snaps or it snaps back. I we're hoping we're yeah. I, we're all hoping for that tipping point. I, yes. I I don't see any indication there is a tipping point, but you'd think there has to be at some point. But 
I, I, so far we haven't reached it. And I, I don't know, tearing down all the statues, the mm. graffiti everywhere, that isn't a tipping point. Business is being closed, people losing it. I mean, you have a few people like the uh, the guy with the big beard that's on Tucker Carlson all the time, I think in New, New Jersey, that owns the gym. That, <laughs> yeah. that's, and, and I like that guy, but but there aren't many people like him in there, but it's it's power in numbers. Everything is a power in numbers if enough people stand up. If you have enough, but as long as it's isolated, as long as everyone's scared to act, and it's just a few voices like that guy that are willing to walk the walk, they're going to keep winning. We have to have power in numbers, but I don't know because I I don't want to risk anything either. I mean, I yeah. people ask me all the time, you know, what are you doing? Well, I am putting myself out there writing and talking about it. I'm saying controversial stuff all the time, but the lots of people are seeing, but I am not going to take any farther than that because I know I live near Washington, D.C. If there's a big rally in Washington, D.C., I know it's not going to draw enough people to make a difference. If, if thousands and thousands of people, yeah, I would love to go there and participate. I'll be a speaker if they ask me. But right. if it's going to be 20 people, 50 people, even 100 people, we might get shot or tasered or at least arrested. And for what? There's no support there. So you have to have power in numbers. And so I don't I guess I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth because I'm criticizing people and not acting. But. I understand it because it yeah. is scary because you, you do risk. You see, as you mentioned, what happens? You say the wrong thing. You can lose your job. So, And that's where I think leadership, that's why we really – you can't expect the public, but you have to – we start to have to start having some uh, some people that have money and, and are in a position much as the founding fathers were mm -hmm. where they can do this. Average people can't do it or certainly our congressional representatives. If the Republicans really are an alternative to this, which they're not – Clearly, they should be standing up in unison. They still have the majority of the Senate. It's not going to be very much longer. They should be attempting to do something. But we know that most of them are, are just as bad as the Democrats. So, yeah. again, I don't know what hope there is. I don't see much hope. I, but I hope you're right that maybe eventually it will reach a breaking point or a tipping point and people will finally fight back. So you think – um, this, is my la this is my last question, I promise. So you think that uh, YouTube and, and all those – Navy released videos of the flying saucers. You think that's a prequel? You think that's a setup to, okay, here, here it comes, uh, February of 2021, yeah. uh, alien invasion. I mean, we've seen a lot of those videos now coming out yep. on yes. YouTube. Yes, and, and well, how surreal would that be, right? I mean, uh, I, exactly. come on. I, 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 I mean, I, I wouldn't predict that. It's, it sounds outlandish, but it sounds outlandish to think that we'd all be scurrying around in masks and keeping six feet apart from each other too. And schools it, it would be really closed. Would, yeah. Sports. I mean, I, so it, it's not more outlandish than that. Now, it, now it would be if I thought real aliens were coming, that'd be a whole different <laughs> ball game. But I don't, I don't think this is, maybe they'd be an improvement. I don't know, but uh, certainly it, w what would be a fake alien invasion. And again, it would be, I think no matter how obvious, I, I suspect the same people that are wearing the masks would believe the fake alien invasion. I think it'd be the same breakdown. People like yeah. us would be saying, how can you believe it's real? You know, they're talking about climate change and stuff, but because they'd probably be giving them a message that they were receptive to, they'd probably believe it. So I, I hope not. I think we've had enough, uh, you know, action and excitement mm -hmm. uh, to last us forever. But at this point, I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen any, I, I never saw any of this coming. I don't know what the end game is. I don't know what the plan is. I, I can't believe they're just planning on, on staying shut down forever, but that looks like what they're planning to do. It certainly does. I mean, they're trying to manipulate numbers every way they possibly can to keep the fire high. And I, I mean, yeah. in, in Orlando here, we had a story two weeks ago, maybe, where the Orlando reporting came out 98% positive pass. <laughs> yes, yes. But in reality, it was 9.8%. That's a huge <laughs> difference. You know, and look and, at all and, the Florida Marlins. I mean, that's what's going to yeah. wreck the baseball. All the Florida Marlins have tested positive, and that's that's going to cause the baseball season to go right there because you know Florida is a hotbed now. And you know, mm -hmm. is it is is it a hotbed because they resented so much when Florida Floridians started going back to the beaches? Because clearly they did. They, they were, absolutely they did. Were, they were, right? So I mean, they were hating that Florida wanted to have fun. How yes, dare us? How <laughs> dare us want to live our lives and have fun and go to the beach? You're, exactly. You're going to catch something on the beach. I mean, come on. Yeah. Give, give me a break. Uh, and then even that they used they used photos of beaches that weren't actually Florida beaches, and and, and that's what they were putting online. Those weren't those aren't Florida beaches, folks. I live five miles from the beach. I know what it looks like, but um, okay. So 
Thank you so much, Don, for, for uh, joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Uh, would you like to take another few minutes? Is there anything else that you're current? I know you're working on a book. Is there anything else that you are currently working on that you'd like to take a, a plug for? Well, I, I hope more people uh, read uh, two of my books. My, my conspiracy books do really well. Hidden mm -hmm. History and Crimes and Cover-Ups are both doing well. They always do well. They sell well. My other books, Survival of the Richest especially, is uh, my kind of my look at it. And I think it's more uh, you know apropos now than ever because we're seeing with the mass evictions coming up and the trillions. We still don't know how much has been stolen by the, the top layers of the 1% during this pandemic. It's, it, it, if we looked at it one way, it's one of the most mass, as Ron Paul called it, the massive transfer for, of wealth from the one percent, from the middle class to the elite. Mm -hmm. and, and we're certainly seeing that. But uh, you know, when you have a situation like Jeff Bezos made $13 billion in one day recently, one day, and I, I did the math, and you're talking about uh, hundreds of centuries yeah. working at $40,000 a year to make 13, what he made in one day. Something is utterly wrong with a system like that it can't be defended so survival of the richest first talked about it long before this pandemic and it's more again more relevant than ever now so i and it has a new forward in the paperback version by naomi wolf a great classical leftist who mm -hmm. i've been uh, we're mutual admiration society i'm so glad that she's out there because there aren't many good people on the left yet but left left but she is one of those so i i wish more people would read that and the other one is bullyocracy uh, as you noted, how the social hierarchy enables bullies rule schools, right. workplaces, and society at large. That had the unfortunate sense of timing of coming out right as this thing hit. So it got lost in the shuffle. I had a book launch party and book signings canceled. Uh, <clears throat> haven't been able to have any since because the bookstores really aren't, aren't open for that. And uh, I had interviews canceled because all anybody wanted to talk about That's why I started talking about this uh, mm -hmm. pandemic because that's all anybody wants to talk about naturally. So I hope people... We'll give that a chance because I, I have gotten more feedback on that than any book because uh, so many people's lives are touched by bullying, and I hear heartrending stories always from people and what they went through and how they're so glad that somebody finally wrote a book about it uh, from the right perspective. So I hope people, anybody who has been bullied or has a loved one that's bullied, please check out Bullyocracy. You're, you won't be uh, sorry you did because it really is the first book written from your perspective, I wrote it for all the victims of bullying who, uh, who's unfortunately the, the same rigged system sides with the bullies and not the people that they're bullying. Well, I mean, I would actually love to have you back on and talk about just that specifically. I know we, we were we pretty to broad t tonight, um, but I would love to have you back on to talk about just specifically that and, and dig into that because I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, it's almost, it's gotten to the point where it's, I mean, I'll write a passage for most children coming up yes. that way, and and you are correct about how workplaces and society are are geared that way. You get rewarded for it all the way up, you know, through your life. Yes. Yes. Um, so okay, so once again, DonaldJeffries.wordpress.com. That's. Or do you have another um, uh, online site, or is that basically the the main well, one? Well, that I don't have a website anymore. So that my blog, I, I blog there regularly. Lou Rockwell. Uh -huh. published is a lot of my stuff, the great libertarian guy, and uh, that's the Ron Paul connection. Ron Paul wrote the forward to crimes and cover-ups, so I was very, very gratified with that. Uh, I always need more followers on Twitter. I'm trying to get more involved with Twitter. I, I, because I, as you probably know, listening to me, I tend to kind of go on and on. I'm a man of words, and so I like to write long Facebook pace and post instead of little short little snippets on Twitter. So I need to do that. It's more. hard to get all that in 140 characters, right? It uh, is. It is. So I, so at at Don Jeffries at Twitter, uh, please. My YouTube channel too, as well. I'm probably going to be transitioning, hopefully soon, to a podcast myself. So I need more uh, subscribers on my uh, YouTube channel because uh, I, I have my weekly radio show, I Protest, which uh, airs on uh, TFR, which is part of the iHeart Radio Network. So uh, people can catch that every Friday from 5 to 7 Eastern Time. Awesome. Well, thanks, Don. I, well, once again, I appreciate it and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks for coming oh, I by. Hope so. Anytime you want me back, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye. So once again, that's Don Jeffries. And we went... We went kind of all over. It was it was a, it was a definitely a broad uh, topic tonight. I would like to get back on with him and narrow it down directly down into that the, the bullying or uh, maybe even something more related to specific cover ups. Maybe with JFK. He was incredibly knowledgeable about that, having read through the majority of uh, the Warren Commission report, twenty six volumes. I mean that's crazy. Uh, talking about the pandemic and and. 
it's so emotional. And you cannot bring up the fact that the numbers are grossly over-reported. And either, it only leaves you with two options. Either it is a conspiracy in some way to, to control you, or it's just incredible gross negligence. And either way, it, are you? Do you feel good about that? Do you feel good that your government and your and your health reporting agencies are so grossly negligent that they are uh, over-reporting cases by a factor of four or five? They're over-reporting deaths by a factor of four or five, and they're telling you that they're doing it this way. They're telling it to you, and you're still really, really worried about it because na naturally you are worried about your health, about your loved one's health, and they know that. And that's not hard. That's that's not that shouldn't be a news flash to anyone. Where we are worried about the people we love. So what better way to gain that control over you? And again, like I mentioned in the podcast, you all control each other. So they don't even have to bring you know, you know the police in and the jackboots and and knocking on the doors and and forcibly doing anything to you. Society does it for them. The the masses will do it for them. They eat their own. So they they plant that seed they put that fear there and then they just let it grow so we you know we talked about that quite a bit i would just personally i would just like to have the real numbers and the accurate reporting and allow you to make your own decision from it from that point on i agree that there is a sickness there and some people um are affected by it significantly more than others that's for sure what i don't trust and what i don't like are the blatant fabrication of results uh, and they're telling you online to your face that they're doing it, but we still selectively hear what we want to hear, and um, you know we're we're not hearing the truth. So Donald Jeffries is out there shouting it from the rooftops, uh, you know, uh, regarding you know the Civil War, World War II, just the way that the history is written. You know, history is written by the victors. History, history is written by the people who won. So they are going to gloss over the potentially the, the warts on their own face. They're not going to show you those. They don't want to tell you that. But nobody's perfect. Nobody has a, a clean closet. There are skeletons everywhere. So if you're going to call out and dox and cancel people with skeletons, everybody is canceled. Everyone. Every person who sends a, a Facebook post should be canceled. We've all done something. What do you think? If you have any concerns or questions, I mean, this was a really good episode in terms of talking about, um, you know, kind of the way that the group think. You can send us a, a message on our Gmail account. It's provemewronghast at gmail.com. You can also drop us a line on Facebook or uh, Instagram. We are Prove Me Wrong. That's the name of the program. If you're just looking for more ways to listen, we are on basically every podcast podcast app that um, you can find. We're on Spotify, TuneIn Radio, SoundCloud, Stitcher. Again, anything that you can find podcasts, you can find the Prove Me Wrong podcast. Like and subscribe to the show and you'll be the first one notified when we have a brand new episode. We typically post every week. So every week on a Sunday, you will see a brand new notification come up that says uh, new Prove Me Wrong podcast. You can be the first on your block to listen. We also have a YouTube channel. You can see the scroll right here on the bottom of the page. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. And once again, you will be notified when we have a uh, new content. As always, new subscribers are always great and appreciated. So once again, drop us a line. Let us know what you think about the discussion tonight. We could have talked. I could have talked to him for three more hours and probably not even scratched the surface. I kind of had to cut it short because I think most people don't really have the patience for a super long podcast, quite honestly. Um, so before we go, tonight our Pro Prove Me Wrong podcast has been brought to you by Java Remix. Java Remix is the perfect blend of 100% organic Arabica coffee infused with nano emulsified CBD. Start your day off on the right foot with a great tasting cup of coffee with all the demonstrated benefits of pure CBD. Java Remix offers traditional ground coffee as well as single serve K-cups in both regular and decaf and if you aren't a coffee person, Java Remix also offers CBD-infused teas and beauty products like bath bombs and body scrubs. As an added benefit for our Prove Me Wrong listeners, if you go online right now, javaremix.com, and enter the promo code Prove Me Wrong, 
you'll get a 20% discount off of your entire shopping experience. Java Remix also offers free shipping on all orders over $40, so you really have no reason not to give it a shot. Once again, that's javaremix.com, promo code Prove Me Wrong. The Prove Me Wrong podcast is brought to you tonight by Zendo Zone Citronella Burners from JT Eaton. They're shaped like fearless bug repellent tiki gods. So go ahead and let Surf and Stan, Hawaiian Howie, and Luau Lily bring the islands to your backyard with Zendo Zone Citronella Burners. Zendo Zones uses natural 3% citronella candles and incense cones. They're perfect for patios, decks, backyards, campsite, poolside, and more. You can enjoy the outdoors again. So you can find them now on Amazon.com and at select Ace Hardware stores. Go ahead and collect them all today. Once again tonight for my guest, Mr. Donald Jeffries. Uh, I'm Pete Lieb. This is the Prove Me Wrong Podcast. We'll talk to you again soon.